Hi everyone, it's Stephanie with The Patient Story. I'm really excited to introduce our guest today, Sherry, who's here to talk about her entire journey after she was diagnosed with mantle cell lymphoma. So Sherry, thank you so much for agreeing to talk to us. Hi, I'm happy to do it. Thank you for inviting me. Of course. And like I said, you look wonderful, right? Um, you, I think, have an incredible story and, you know, have been in remission for such, you know, such a long time. It's, I think, just, you know, going to give hope to people, right? And you're, you're here to share your entire part of the story. So we're not sugarcoating things either. Um, but on that note, how are you feeling today? Feel great today. I did a little line dancing this this morning, and I'm sort of like the de facto instructor. So uh, just had a, had a good time with the eight of my best buddies. So it was fun. Wonderful. Okay, and we'll talk more about you know quality of life and things that you did to you know keep that cherry sort of joy going on even during treatment. Um, but I'd love to just start with the you know first symptoms. And I know mantle cell lymphoma presents. Um, sometimes very slowly or differently in people. But for you, what was that? What did it look like? Uh, well, that's the weirdest thing. It, I didn't really have anything that you would call a symptom that I recognized. Um, I had just done this incredible endurance bike ride, because <clears throat> that's my thing. I'm a cyclist. And it was 160 miles in nine hours. And uh, But I was having like some problems with laryngitis. And it had nothing to do with the lymphoma, but that's what made me go to the doctor to make sure that I wasn't coming down with something uh, because we were for my 50th birthday, which was the next month, that was May 9, um, uh, 2004, we were going to the south of France to do a bike tour, my husband and I, with an, uh, a, a tour tour group, so like two other people. And uh, I, I went to the doctor to make sure that I wasn't coming down with a virus and uh, the PA who we saw all the time felt my neck and he said it, there, that all the lymph glands around my neck here were, it was like a string of pearls. He said, this isn't normal. He says, you got to get that checked out. And uh, the, I, I said, I will as soon as I get back from my vacation, you know, because otherwise I felt fine and I, I didn't have any other symptoms. I had no pain. I wasn't tired. I mean, uh, just didn't have any real symptoms. So um, I, when I, that's, that was all it was, was the lymph glands that I didn't even notice. So it's, yeah, it's so interesting. Um, at least you were able to catch something. You felt something that was enough to get you to go to the doctor. Then you did go to an ENT in mid-May, um, right. in your time timeline and his reaction was something else. Can you describe? What he said? <laughs> well, he's feeling around here and then he gets to this part over here and he goes, Whoa. I'm like, what do you mean? Whoa, I said, Mark, you know, and I actually knew he was a bike club buddy. He, was, he actually was in my bike club. And I was like, what do you mean, whoa? Doctors don't say, whoa. They say, oh, this is interesting. Oh, this, this needs to be checked out. Not, whoa. So it was a little bit freaky. Uh, so anyway, he says, we got to do a biopsy of this. And I said, well, uh, it'll have to be after Memorial weekend because I was going to my niece's wedding. And I was wearing this little strappy dress and I didn't want this, you know, bandage sticking out there. And, uh, I, and so I waited until uh, after Memorial weekend and unbeknownst to me, my sister told me later that she said she could see this enlarged lump from across the room. I had no idea. Wow. That's incredible. Like in hindsight, when you hear these things, right, it's a bit mind boggling. Um, yeah, and so you were able to go to your niece's wedding. Hopefully, have a great time dancing. No problem. Dancing. Yeah, like I said, um, I had no wasn't hurt. I was I had no right. symptoms of anything. So right, exactly. And and so then in June, June tenth, you have a biopsy. Now, was this a right. a, ne a needle biopsy or what was it? And can you describe yes. the way the the process for people who haven't ever undergone one? Okay. Well, I'm needle phobic, or I was. This actually did help me get over it, uh, but um, what what the doctor did was it was in his office and he, he used some, what they call LMX cream. That's the name of the cream. It's a, it's a lidocaine cream, put it on there for about an hour till it numbed the skin because I was freaked out. Most people would probably say, Oh, who cares? Uh, anyway, he basically did a needle biopsy and, um, oh, no, wait, no, that wasn't it. I take it back. 
that the, the needle was from a seroma that he had to drain. I actually was put under a, a, an anesthesia and he actually cut some lymph glands out. I remember that now, wow. It's just been a long time, chemo brain. Uh, and yes, I remember that now because he had to really uh, slice out, he took a, a group of lymph glands. Right, out. so that was an excisional biopsy. They actually had Ooh, to take them correct. out. I, yes, and that was not in his office. That was in a hospital. Gotcha. Under, under like propofol or something like that. It wasn't right. super. Yeah, and I underwent that too. So if you could describe to people, I mean, you're sleeping, you don't feel it. Um, right? No idea. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> when you woke up, did you have any pain or do you remember how long it took also to get the results? Oh, well, that was the thing that was weird. I don't remember, you know, any specific pain from that, you know, from that excision uh, procedure. Uh, but about a week, like I said, about a week later, I, I went in because it was, it was swelling a lot. And I went in and he, that's when he had to drain it. It, it was it's what they call a seroma. And that can happen. It was it, nothing serious. Uh, but they still didn't have the results. And so every day that went by that I didn't get results, I figured it couldn't be that bad because if it was something bad, they would have told me by now. Uh, anyway, so he said, no, haven't, haven't heard yet. And uh, it was three days later um, that he contacted me and said, come on in because we got the results. And that was a very surreal experience. Um, he, he took the stitches out, you know, in, you know, inspected the thing and he took the stitches out and he, you know, and he says, okay, uh, now let's, let's get to your report. He goes over and he takes the report and he goes, unfortunately, it's not good news you have lymphoma. So now I will tell you, even though part of the shari part of me says, it was probably just an infection. This is all a big deal for nothing. Nah, nah, nah. There was a little part of me that was worried that it might be something because um, I, my father died from lymphoma. My father's older brother died from multiple myeloma. And interestingly, three months before my diagnosis, my father's younger brother was diagnosed with lymphoma. Wow. So now they did tell me that there was no familial link with lymphoma, but I'm like, wow. hey. and my grandmother, my father's mother mm -hmm. had uh, Hodgkin's disease when she was 80. So, so it, it, it's in my family, Moo, right? Anyway, the, uh, so, so the, um, when the doctor said you have lymphoma, uh, my first thought was, you know, because I was thinking about my dad who died in 95. I'm like, how the fuck am I going to tell my mother? And then I said, Jeff, my husband was with me. And the doctor had handed me a box of tissues. And I looked at my husband who started crying and I handed him the box of tissues. And I said, okay, what's next? Wow. Give me a plan of action. Give me a plan of action. What do I do next? You just kicked into gear. Then that was it. From that point on, I just need to know what was next. And the next thing to do was to get staged and then figure out how we have to go from there. You know, I, I can feel that energy as you're describing it. I, I feel like I'm in the room with you when you're like, okay, I'm like ready to go. What's the next deal? Um, I, I'm, I'm curious. I'd love for you to, to talk here, highlight because everyone has different reactions to these things and different philosophies. Um, mm -hmm. You were in this sort of, okay, I've just got to do this. So what's next? Can you tell me more about, or tell us more about um, your husband's reaction and then how you were able to eventually break the news to your family in particular, your mother. And of course that was <laughs> sensitive because of all the family history. Right. Well, that's, that's, that was, uh, my mom at the time was living up in New Jersey. She was a snowbird. So this was summer. She was up in New Jersey at her summer place and uh, I was, I'm in Florida. Well, my, my whole thought, like that other part of me that said, you know, my father had lymphoma, what about me? And I was like, I wanted to have a reaction um, that I could be proud of. I didn't want to burst into tears. I didn't want to crumple on the floor in a fetal position. I wanted to be somebody I could be proud of that. I, okay, I'm reacting. And you know, it really wasn't a conscious thought. This is just how I am. I'm a little type A. I'm, okay, I'm a type A plus. So I, I just needed, you know, I needed to move forward. I needed to know what to do next. So from that, from there, he told me you need to get staged and, you know, you have to figure out 
you know, whether, whether it's an indolent form or if it's being aggressive or whatever. So anyway, from there, we went out the door and um, Jeff is still a little bit on the numb side. He's not saying a whole lot. So I was like, let's just get in the car. I got, we got in the car. The first thing I did was I called um, my other doc. I called work because we went there from work. We worked together at the time. Uh, and I, I had let, we left there from work. So I called work. I said, I'm not going to be in. I just got diagnosed with lymphoma. I couldn't say cancer. Cancer sounded worse for some reason. I said, I just got diagnosed with lymphoma and I have things to do. And they're like freaking out. Next call, I called my family practice doctor and I said, I've, I've got to come in. I just got this diagnosis and I need to talk to Dr. Nannan. So, whereas, so the next call I made, I called my sister. Now, they remember, they all knew, my family all knew that I was getting this biopsy and that I was making light of it. Uh, I called my sister, Judy, it's, it's lymphoma. And I said, I need you to talk to, to tell Rick. I said, I've got things to do. I, I'm moving here. I said, you got to call Ricky, my brother. And uh, he's my big brother. She's my little sister. I said, and let him know. And you have to go. Oh, you can't call mom. I'm not calling mom to tell her this. You have to go there. So she, you know, my sister is kind of like me. She takes it over. She misorganized and said, okay, fine, we're going to do this. So I knew I could leave it in good hands with her. And uh, we went over to my doctor's and, and I sat in this waiting room filled with people and I told them who, you know, told them at the desk what I was there for. Two seconds later, he comes out, Sherry, come in here. Like <laughs> these people are giving me dirty looks. Uh, and anyway, so. We, we had that, you know, he was going, he told, and this is interesting, he said to me, he said, if you're going to have cancer, lymphoma is probably the best one for you to get because it actually does have a pretty good cure rate. So that right there made me feel better. He said, whatever you do, don't go home and look up mantel cell lymphoma on the computer. I know you, you're going to do that. Of course I did. <laughs> <laughs> But going back to what happened with up north, I, I could just see this. My, my sister and brother knew that my mom was having a luncheon so that she'd be home. And so around the time after her luncheon, they both went up and I could just imagine this, like as soon as she opens the door and sees them, she's going to know. Yeah. It's, you know, like if you have a, a you know, if you have a soldier who's right. a, overseas and you open the door and it's the, the lieutenant and the chaplain, you know what they're going to. So I, I felt actually, I said to my husband, I said, you know what, I'm, I'm actually glad I'm the one with lymphoma, not the one telling my mother I have lymphoma. <laughs> so it, it is interesting. Sometimes I hear from people, it's easier to be the patient than the caregiver in many aspects, you know? Uh, mm -hmm. And this is sort of one of those tough times. Um, but I'm glad you had family to help do that for you. I mean, I think, you know, along our, our conversation, if you have any tips or guidance, just guidance, it's not even necessarily advice, but things you learned, feel free to share them with people. And I think one thing you're pointing out is, hey, look, just, you have a lot on your plate, you can do it, but maybe take stuff off your plate, give it to people you know can handle it. Yes. Yeah. And that's, a, that's a big part of it. And I am very, very fortunate that I have very supportive family all over and very supportive friends. They all, it's amazing how people came, came out for me. Right. Right. And I'd love, I'd love to talk about the support too. Um, a little bit later on, I do want to ask you, I mean, so at the ENT office, you get the diagnosis. Did the doctor say, they, he did say mantle cell lymphoma or? He said mantle cell lymphoma. And, and he said that the reason it took so long was that the lab um, was so distressed by this diagnosis that they took the sample, the, the tissue, and sent it out to another lab in California to have them test it. Mm. And then, you know, so it was double checked and that's why it took so long. No. Right. And, uh, and I, the profile is usually a little different. You were really young for this. Um, it's usually men more than women. But mm. um, I did just interview another woman who was, I think, 50 when she was diagnosed. So it does happen. Um, and, and then it says in your timeline. So, you know, next steps, you were like, OK, what do I do next? Can you outline some of that for us? I know it says you went to Cleveland Clinic for staging. 
And right. you, that's a lot of things, MRIs, blood work, PET scans, bone marrow biopsy. If you could take us through that, um, sort of summarize that for us, but then also describe for people what each of those sort of scan or tests involves. Uh, well, <laughs> I did not have very good experiences there. First of all, uh, I, I just didn't feel comfortable with the, uh, the oncologist, the hematology oncologist, whose name I cannot remember for the life of me, uh, because I only saw her twice, you know, uh, for the bone marrow biopsy and then a follow-up. And they, uh, because I was, it was being done in the office. And now my uncle, remember I said my uncle was diagnosed three months before me. And I, I talked, called him when I found out. And uh, I, I, he, I said, I've got, I've got to have this bone marrow biopsy. He goes, oh, it's nothing. Well, my husband, my, my uncle has a very high pain tolerance and like haircuts hurt me. So I don't have really a high pain tolerance, especially for needles. Uh, so anyway, he says a big nothing. Oh, he lied to me so much. Uh, anyway, so the, the doctor at Cleveland Clinic was giving me what they call a bilateral and that which on both sides of my hip. And it, in, it entailed me laying face down on a table that sort of put my butt up in the air. And then she, you know, they drill down into the, you know, the bone and suck out the bone marrow. My, Jeff told me it kind of looked almost like raspberry jam. I can never eat raspberry jam ever again. Thanks so uh, much, Jeff. <laughs> all, they, she gave me Ativan mm. to take an hour or so before to calm me down. It, I took two of them. I'm only supposed to take one and it still wasn't doing anything. I was, I was in a lot of pain, but that was me. I even had Jeff, he was in there with me. I said, squeeze my toes, just squeeze my toes. And he's squeezing my big toes. So now my big toes hurt and my hips hurt. So I was not really good at this. I, I don't know whether or not she just had bad technique, but it was very, it was, it was traumatizing. And then of course she had to do the second one. By the time she got to the second, oh, that's the, she put some Ativan under my tongue while I was there to try to get me to calm down. It really didn't take until she was halfway through the other one. And uh, then of course, all the Ativan I took, all just, you know, started working all at once. I have no recollection about the whole rest of the day. Uh, but I, I, I just remember it was, it was really not a good experience. Right. The, the, PET scans, they, uh, the x-rays, those things that weren't bad. The MRI that I had, they wanted to do an MRI of my brain just to make sure it hadn't gone anywhere else. And uh, the dye, you know, it's like a, I don't know, radioactive dye, I don't know what it is, but it, it she, she did something wrong when she was putting the needle in and it leached into my arm and it felt like an acetylene torch on the inside of my arm. And I'm crying and wailing and the snot's running down my nose and I'm blubbering like an idiot. And, you know, she actually had to get some ice packs and put it on there because it was very painful. It's like this. So uh, needless to say, I didn't stay with the Cleveland Clinic. <laughs> it's like really was not going to stay there. But then uh, the next time I saw the doctor was the follow-up when they got the results back of this bilateral bone marrow biopsy. How long did actually, that take, do you remember? Hard, uh, I, I don't think it was that long. I think it might have been a week, okay. something like that. Okay. I mean, she might have gotten the results sooner and that's the that's when she could see me, but it was about a week, I think. Um, but she it's a, it actually turned out to be a good <clears throat> thing she did a bilateral because the it was so diffuse in my bone marrow because it was still very, very early even though it was stage four, because it was now not just in the mantle cell, uh, the, the lymph glands itself, it was in the bone marrow. And that automatically makes it stage four. But it was so diffuse that they found it on one side of my hip and they didn't see it in the other. Mm -hmm. So if they would have just taken that, that one side, mm -hmm. it might not have been diagnosed in time. So, uh, that was good. And then when she started talking to me about your options, she was so laissez-faire about that. Well, you could do this, or you could do that, and you might want to think about this or that. And, you know, and I, I, 
that wasn't, I needed a plan of action. <laughs> so, anyway, so, okay, so we, that's when Jeff and I started going doctor shopping in a good way. So. Yeah, no, and I, I, I love how you wrote that. You were like, heat monk shopping. I was like, what is that? Um, <laughs> well, I, I interviewed, I interviewed right. different hem, hematology oncologists. No, and I, I you know, and I, I thought that's a really great point to talk about, actually, because, you know, different patients and caregivers have different experiences. Sometimes you meet someone, the first oncologist, and boom, you feel that's the right person. Many times it's not like that, right? And I think this is part of the message of self-advocacy, right? You didn't yes. say, well, this is the first person I've got. Of course, there's some situations where the cancer is so aggressive or something, you don't have that much time. So it's all right. a balance. But given your situation, you thought, okay, I can make a better decision for myself. Um, it was her style that kind of put you off. Can you talk more about what then, um, through your, I guess, your hemonk shopping, what you were looking for and really what you learned so that maybe it might help other people? in that process of second opinion, third opinion? I think, well, first of all, something like this, regardless, you should get at least a second opinion to see what the other, another doctor would say. And uh, she was so like, well, you could do this, you could do that. How am I supposed to make the decision? I, I just wouldn't know. So right there, I knew I needed to talk to at least one other doctor to see what they, if they all, if they said the same thing, oh, it's really indolent, you can, you can wait and see, which I, I, I couldn't wait and see, that's just not my nature. So we, uh, one of my friends uh, is actually, he was a transplant surgeon up in the Mayo Clinic in Jacksonville. He got me in to see the, hem hem uh, the Hemonk in, in Mayo Clinic uh, to see what, you know, so that I could go in to see him and, and get an evaluation. Um, so we went up to Jacksonville for that. Uh, another one of my friends who was, uh, actually she was suffering from an islet cell cancer, which is like a form of pan pancreatic cancer. She was diagnosed about six months uh, with her cancer before I was with mine. And she was going to the Moffitt Cancer Center and said, these people are great, you have to come here. So we found a doctor there that we could see. Uh, he actually was having a, uh, a trial for mantle cell lymphoma. And I said, well, maybe I can get in this, this trial, phase two trial. And then uh, there was also in, uh, I called, uh, somebody had given me the name of a doctor. And oh, actually, my, what am I saying? My uh, primary care physician gave me the name of a doctor in, a, in a, uh, an oncology group right down the street from where I live. When I called there and they said, well, what kind of cancer do you have? And I said, lymphoma. So, oh, you need to talk to Dr. Greenberg. He's our lymphoma expert. I said, fine. So then I went to see him. Now, all three of these doctors said exactly the same thing. You need to go, you need to have a, a, a chemotherapy to put yourself in remission, followed by a bone marrow uh, transplant from a sibling donor, preferably a sibling donor. That is, can actually cure, you know, change your immune system out, new immune system, your cure. So of all these doctors, they, they all said the same thing. The Mayo Clinic doctor wanted to do a much more aggressive uh, chemotherapy regimen called hyper CVAD, which required a hospital stay, this and the other. The other two doctors, the one at the Moffitt who said, I don't want you in my trial because you're young. It's early. The trial is really for people who don't have any options left. So this is what you need to do, chemotherapy, uh, chop with rituxan, followed by uh, bone marrow uh, transplant. And then I go to Dr. Greenberg, he says the same thing. And he, he and I just like, from the moment I walked in there, we started talking, we hit it off. Mm. I, like I said, he's like, a, he's like a kindly uncle. I mean, he's like my age, but he felt like a kindly right. uncle. He felt no, he familiar. Good. Yep. So that, that, I said, you know what, why when I travel over to Tampa or up to Jacksonville, I got this great guy in my backyard. And it turned out he had a CV as long as your arm. It's his <laughs> curriculum vitae. Yes. He, he was very impressive. Very right. impressive. So he was impressive and he checked the mark of uh, all the boxes of personality and, and connection with you. So I'm so yeah. glad you were able to find the right, right match for you. Um, we're going to end this portion of our, our talk and just, you know, we'll find, um, if you want to hear about Sherry's treatment, just go on to the next video. But Sherry, stick with us for one second. Okay.